Thank you so much for joining us for another live Action for Happiness event. My name is Mark Williamson, and it's wonderful to have you being with us all together in this amazing global community from wherever you are in the world right now. And I'm so honoured and delighted that we're joined today by Dakar Keltner. Dakar, it's really great to have you with us. Thank you for being here. It's good to be with you, Mark, as, as always. I'm a big fan of your work and all the fantastic things uh, that you've been doing with your research and with the Greater Good Science Centre, but particularly pleased that today we're going to be talking about this theme of awe and your wonderful book and work on this topic. So for anyone who's joining for the first time, a very warm welcome. This is a very friendly, supportive community. We're going to be learning and sharing together. There's a chance for you all to get involved in the chat and please do keep it friendly and kind and relevant as always. And we're going to do a few interactive things along the way based on Dhaka's work and also there's a chance for you to ask questions during the event. So please do use the Q&A function um, and later on we'll come to some of those. Um, so thank you again to all the members of the Action for Happiness community for being part of this amazing family all around the world, trying to create a happier and kinder world together. And these events are just one of many of the things we're doing together as a community, including lots of uh, fantastic online resources, courses, local groups, and volunteering opportunities. So please do look into that if you'd like to be even more involved. But let's get on with today's theme of awe and wonder. And I wondered if we could start maybe, Dhaka, obviously you have this amazing academic credentials, but also maybe you could share a little bit about your backstory and perhaps what's brought you to this theme of awe. Yeah, you know, sometimes in an academic career, when you do science, you get to study, you know, the mysteries of your own life in some sense and the culture that you were brought up in. And uh, in many ways, I think I was, I'm here on earth to study awe. Um, I was raised in a wild time <laughs> in the late 1960s in a very wild part of the United States, Laurel Canyon, where there's a lot of rock and roll and political protest and drugs and so forth. And it was an amazing time, you know, especially musically in that area, as people will know. And, and I was raised by interesting counterculture parents who, who really oriented my mind and heart to awe. You know, my mom taught romanticism and poetry and Virginia Woolf, and my dad was a painter. And so our house was just this wild place. And, um, and you know, growing up in that, that mix, and then after Laurel Canyon, we all moved to the country and I just wandered foothills and mountains and wild rivers and trees and you know and listened to birds and so I had a childhood of all um, and doing the science my parents were both artists I wasn't very good at the arts <laughs> you know almost got thrown out of my art class and so you know that I turned to math and science to understand this mysterious emotion that really I feel you know, as Einstein said, is just this most human of emotions. And I was luckily lucky to just have it activated as a, a child and, and then to rely on science to understand it. So what I love about this topic, and thank you for that intro, is that at one level, awe is something I think we can all kind of relate to, this sense of like being overwhelmed in some way by yeah. something that we're part of. But also, it, it's also quite maybe inaccessible for some of us. It feels yeah. perhaps a little bit too existential and um, universal. And I wonder maybe if we could start with a definition. How do you think about what you mean by this word? Yeah, I mean, this one is, you know, a lot of people feel that awe resists definition. It's ineffable. Words can't get to it. William James, the great American psychologist, after an ecstatic experience called words, tattered fragments that just can't make sense of awe. So, what I did to define awe in this book is, um, and really for 15, 20 years I've been working at this, is read ex accounts of spiritual, mystical experience and read about, you know, experiences in nature of environmentalists and, uh, and in music and then relied on philosophy and in particular Edmund Burke, this great philosopher from the 18th century, and through that defined awe as an emotion you feel, so it's a fleeting state when you encounter vast mysteries that you don't understand right that are beyond your knowledge and beyond your frame of reference so you see a, an, a lightning storm sort of start a wildfire or you see somebody decide to give their organs to somebody they don't even know right or you contemplate 
DNA or, or space. Um, and, you know, so that starts to unite all these incredible experiences of all on this definition of an emotion you feel when you encounter vast mysteries. Then what's interesting, Mark, and this helps people ground an understanding of awe is that awe has a regular effect on your body, right? You get goosebumps, you get the, the tears, your, your throat will choke. You feel warm in your chest, right? You feel sort of small and quiet. That helps us sort of understand the embodied part of this emotion we feel in response to vast mysteries. Yeah, you're actually evoking some of those emotional memories in me so i remember as a child mm. being away with my family and seeing an incredible sunset um mm. uh, and it moving me to tears and being really surprised by that as a mm. as a fairly you know young boy and then also i remember many experiences of music that evokes that kind of shivers down the spine sense of connection so those are two very kind of you know i guess nature and music are ones we might immediately think of um but I wonder if maybe we could use this as a moment before we go into some of the, the eight wonders that I know you define in the book, which I'd love to explore with you. Maybe we could turn to the community briefly and actually listen to everyone here who's with us and sort of think about some of the uh, experiences we might have, have had of all. Do you want to get us to think about that together for a yeah. moment? Maybe after we to share something. Thank you, Mark. You know, uh, everyone out in our, our community, I want you to reflect on this question. And it really is a question that I've been asking for years. And then just to offer and chat a couple words to summarize what arises in your mind. And the question is, you know, to um, think back to a recent experience of all you've had, right? Just where you felt like this is vast and mysterious and makes you feel a sense of wonder and a sense of humility, maybe tearing up a little. I saw Mark tear up a little when he was thinking about it. Um, so. Just reflect on it. And then in chat, just offer a couple of words, you know, saw killer whales or, you know, listen to Chopin's piano sonatas, whatever it is. Offer in chat a couple of words to tell us what you felt awe in response to. Sunsets and hawks and refugee families and night skies and giving birth. Uh, moonlit sky. These are amazing. <laughs> yeah, a lot of star, a lot of stargazing. But I love some of the words here, like flowers in Regent's Park, a rolling thunderstorm, the northern lights, seeing and oh, I'm not quite sure what that was. It went past too fast. But um, yeah, music, wildflowers. Uh, I, I saw another one about the birth of a child, new growth after winter, shared woodland moment with a deer. Mm. Um, I sometimes have some shared moments with deers while I'm cycling through Richmond Park, which can be uh, or and danger all combined into one moment. Um, bees collecting pollen, birds migrating. These are wonderful. What are you? How are you feeling as you see these uh, examples, Dad? Well, one of the remarkable things about awe, and I've already felt it twice, is we feel awe in hearing of other people's stories of awe, <laughs> and I'm feeling, you know, the marvels of this emotion and and how we're seeing it from around the world. Uh, what sort of things allow us to feel this mysterious emotion? How are you feeling? I love ants at work and the ocean and a hummingbird and um, orcas and moon shadows. This is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so obviously incredibly diverse, uh, quite yeah. a lot of, you know, links to nature yeah. um, and the wonders of life and the preciousness of life. But yeah. I know you've, you, you've actually used that phrase wonders of life and you've, you've sort of grouped them into eight. So yeah. I wondered maybe, um, I'm sure we'll dive into a few of them in a bit more detail, but would you perhaps like to lay out how you sort of have, have characterized these different sort of components of awe? Yeah, and thank you everybody for your stories. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're evoking all kinds of memories in Mark and me here. So it's, it's yeah. a, a wonderful sharing experience. Yeah, so, you know, as I started to do the science of awe, you know, you can measure it in the body and in the brain. And, you know, when people feel awe, they're like, whoa. <laughs> uh, but I felt... I didn't feel satisfied because I felt that scientific measurement didn't really get to the spirit of awe. And what we needed to do was to gather stories, right? Uh, and let people like we're doing here, Mark, you know, tell their stories of awe. So my students and I uh, gathered stories of awe from 26 countries around the world, you know, India, Mexico, um, uh, somebody just said great orgasm and I got distracted. <laughs> uh, um, you know, all over the world. 
uh, radically different countries. And then it took us about two years to, to translate and code these stories into what I call the eight wonders of life, where we can find awe. And what they are, and I see them reoccurring in our examples here is nature, other people's moral beauty, kindness and sacrifice. Somebody mentioned, you know, somebody's compassion moving with other people together, right? Dancing, political protests, sports. Um, and then you get to cultural stuff, music, visual design, and spirituality. And I saw a couple of examples of encountering the divine. That's six. And then two interesting ones, which are, which are big ideas, right? Some people get awestruck by the idea of evolution or DNA or, or quantum physics, um, big ideas. And then really strikingly, Mark, like you said earlier, um, the life cycle, right? We feel awe when humans come into the world. We feel awe when people pass away. So those I call the eight wonders of life. And they're just a really good roadmap for how can I find more awe in my everyday life? Mm. Wonderful. And I, I love to have a chance to dive into all of those, but maybe we'll just yeah. pick a few that seem to emerge. So, so nature's obviously come up a lot. Yeah already in the chat and I guess it's maybe what I first thought of but it's interesting that it seems to be both these completely jaw-dropping staring at the sky and looking at the sort of infinity of the universe through to a tiny ant in front of me and it's sort yeah. of like this amazing range of perspectives yeah but we also know as I'm sure you you know even more than I do about the amazing benefits for our overall well-being of being yeah. in nature and appreciating you know the outdoors and sunlight and so on but but what, what what's going on with our connection to nature and the way and, and these sort of different types of scale almost are they are they the same experience or is it actually different when it's local as opposed to, to universal almost yeah that's a terrifically sophisticated and nuanced question um what's striking about um those examples and our you know our as the science has, under, has got, gotten underway on how we re respond to nature with awe. Uh, and Dr. Yuri Salidwin, an indigenous scholar, calls it ecological belonging, which I think is the best way to summarize this, which is that our bodies are part of nature, right? We are part of an ecosystem. Sounds of water activate the vagus nerve. Scents from flowers trigger certain neurochemical patterns in the brain that bring about awe. And what happens with natural experiences or experiences of awe in our relationship to nature is we realize the systems that are around us, right? It might be the small system of, you know, fungi that un lie under the earth or a system, a, a wave system that's part of the tides or a cloud system or a very tiny little system of bugs, right? That the key to awe is the recognition, the embodied recognition that I'm part of these systems of life. And in nature, it comes about from the vast and the small, which is remarkable. Sometimes you look under a microscope and you see a cell. I remember looking, I got this material from our pond that I grew up in and I put it under a microscope and I saw all this life. And I was like, oh my God, you know, there's life everywhere and I'm part of it. Um, and that's the key realization that awe brings about. So uh, from big and small, as you very nicely yeah. into our awareness. And where that, what that brings up for me next is, is this idea of spirituality and it's broadly yeah. sense because yeah. of course there's something rather remarkable about these questions we can't really ask answer sorry about how life emerged and how consciousness emerged and the great mysteries of of life in general and I mean I personally grew up in a very religious family mm. my, my family were Christian but it's I did I didn't carry that forward myself I sort of think of myself as a compassionate um secular uh, person not not against religion but certainly not an active practitioner of religion and yet somehow I feel spiritual in the sense of being absolutely in awe of life and mm. connected to other living beings and creatures and the universe around me despite not having a deity that I worship in any way um what do you, do you think it's a universal thing that we all have this sense of uh, spirituality in that sense even if we don't practice a faith is that is that common yeah I mean First of all, you know, and we did some work on this, you know, as William James and Emerson and a lot of and a lot of the great spiritual texts like the Bhagavad Gita really make the case that it's feeling in which we relate to the divine and awe and bliss and ecstasy. 
returning to nature for a moment, a lot of the great indigenous traditions, as Dr. Urias Lalidwin and others have written, uh, really raising this into consciousness in Western European cultures, they really feel that spirit is a life animating force that is in all sentient beings, right? And, and we just feel that when we feel awe. 40% of Western Europeans feel out in nature when they have big experiences of awe, they feel spiritual. They feel like they've encountered something transcendent in terms of a life animating force. And I, you know, it was so interesting writing this book, Mark, because I did it in a period of grief, having lost my brother and really was confused. And my experiences in nature started to feel that way, that there's something, some system of meaning much bigger than me in physics uh, that transcends time and space that I was part of. And I felt that through nature, you know, mm -hmm. and I started to feel like those 40% of Western Europeans who, when they look at a lake or the night sky or shooting stars or spring blossoms, they're like, this is divine, truly spirit. And it's so a, could you just a say great a bit question more about that word divine because I mean I've heard that obviously mentioned in a in a religious context what do you mean in divine and perhaps a broader than just when one, any one particular religion it's you know this is a tough territory to define you know <laughs> as hard as awe is to define it's just as hard to define spirit and divine and I think when you consult scholars who are really thinking hard about all the different religious traditions spiritual traditions they think about it as some animating force that brings life and meaning across living forms right as and when you see that just like you know brahman and atman in, in the hinduism tradition you see this force that unites us all right that is some common soul if you will and i and i think that that's part of what so i would define it and there will be challenges to this rightfully so as some force that we all share that animates what we feel to be living in 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 the present moment. Um, and awe really is a pathway to getting us to think about what, what that means to us. Mm, thank you. And of course, how would uh, you define it? It's it's really unifying discussion. And also, of course, very well, well this whole community is very welcoming for people yeah. of all faiths and none. And I guess that that what you've just said is also quite a good bridge into two of the other things you mentioned as components of all. One about the collective movement being together. Obviously, religions have a great, you know, singing together and being together. But what, that could also, as you said, be protest movements or physical activities. I'm a big sport fan. I love. I went to watch a football match with my son nice. uh, the other day. Um, but also, you talked about this. I love this idea of moral beauty. Seeing people do good things for each other again, something that all great religious traditions encourage the sort of caring for others the kindness that I, I know is within this community can you say a little bit more about collective movement and moral beauty thank you mark you know um i'll start with collective movement and then i think the the longer story is moral beauty you know um when we gather these stories of all um you know in an open-ended fashion the these stories started to roll in of like I was at a political protest and everybody was putting their arms up at the same time, or I was cheering on Nottingham Forest, right? Or I uh, I was part of a dance group or I was singing with other people, which also has music in it. And it turns out um, this is a, a powerful source of awe. Emile Durkheim, this great sociologist, wrote about collective effervescence. You know, you go see music, you watch a dance performance, you're dancing yourself you're playing a sport, those all have this potential to sync us up with other people and literally unite minds, right? And suddenly we go from being an individual self to we're all cheering, you know, the Grateful Dead or whatever it is in front of us. Um, and that becomes all inspiring and that's collective effervescence. And the science on that just staggers me, which is the minute you start syncing up with people in movement, it transforms yourself, right? You suddenly are like, ah, I'm not this individual. I'm part of this group or tribe or we. My individual narcissistic concerns, they don't matter, you know? I'm part of this, this, this sense of community uh, through collective effervescence. Our, our common humanity, as Louise says, it brings you this sense of like, we're all united by some core force in life. And then moral beauty really shocked us, Mark. Um, you know. We gather these stories. I thought awe would largely be a, an emotion about nature and religion around the world. And in fact, it's about 
other people, ordinary people around us, other people's sacrifices, courage, overcoming, you know, really extraordinary achievements like, you know, playing the violin or, or you know, an Olympic swimmer. So, you know, what's really striking to me is the sublime and the transcendent is found in our careful attention to the wonders of ordinary people and, and how remarkable humans are. So I, I find great hope in that, so that finding. Mm, I do too. And I, and I see it every day in this action for happiness, sort of global yeah. family, because what people tell us again and again, in fact, the most common story we hear from people is something along the lines of, I've had some challenges in my life. I've been in a difficult place. I found some things that boost my own well-being. What I want to do most now is help others discover this too. It's almost right. like when you're in a sufficiently stable place yourself, you naturally develop a sense of like, I want others to discover this. I want to help yeah. others. And we know that volunteering gives us a huge you know, boost, but it's, it's not that we're doing it for the boost for ourselves. It's sort of like, it's something about a, a collective benefit. We like instinctively know that when we're good to others and we encourage kindness, that everyone benefits. And that's like, a it just, it feels right almost. And yeah, yet we have it, a culture that sort of discourages it. So I wonder how we, maybe briefly, we could just talk about how, how, how could we be shaping our culture to encourage more of this collective effervescence, this moral beauty? Because it feels like it's naturally within us, but almost hampered by modern society. Yeah, no, it drives me nuts, you know, that, um, and I think that, you know, there are a lot of uh, extensions of the awe science in this book into applied realms like this. I'll give you a few examples. You know, we're building an awe course for educators that will reach tens of thousands of educators that is based on our this kind of conversation, which is if a student is learning history or literature or science, um, there are people whose moral beauty inspire those forms of knowledge. That should be part of education. I did this. This is a really simple thing. For everyone out in our audience to do, I started to work with um, healthcare providers during the pandemic, Kaiser Permanente, largest deliverer of healthcare in the United States, I think. And what I would have them do is say, um, you know, these are folks who are watching a million people die in horrible conditions, understaffed, chaos in the American healthcare system during COVID. And they uh, started telling, sharing stories of moral beauty in their work. They would get together in little huddles of medical doctors and nurses and assistants and so forth. And just for five minutes say, what's a story of moral beauty you saw in the last week? And it was patients, you know, feeling grateful, even though they're going to die, a, a colleague doing a medical procedure that saved a life, so much moral beauty around. So those are just two examples of how we need to move away from Facebook's algorithms of making us enraged. And, and shift towards like, how do we surface like this network, right? How people, how readily we sacrifice and how courageous we are. I think, I think we're pretty good at it and we just need to return to it. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for this work and, and for starting this conversation that we're all benefiting from here because it's another re reminder of how important this stuff is and the power it can have. Um, I'd love to come to some more sort of practical day-to-day -day examples in a moment. Yeah. Just briefly, you did mention the story of your brother passing and that sort of links to this other aspect in the eight wonders of, of life and death i mean obviously you experienced a, a loss and a loss of a loved one is always a traumatic experience but there is something that I, I feel that with loss that always wakes us up to the preciousness of life and to what really matters do you want to say a bit more about both the life and death aspects of war but also maybe you'd like to share a bit about your own personal connection with that yeah it was uh Thank you, Mark. It was transformative. Um, you know, that wild child that I had of my mom, the poetry literature professor, dad and artist, wild times, I shared with a companion in awe who was my brother and, you know, Rolf. And he was one year younger than me. He was always bigger than me, which was interesting. Um, and, and we did every awe-inspiring thing together. You know, all the eight wonders, music and nature and, you know, moral beauty and big ideas. And then he got colon cancer uh, and, you know, it was brutal. And four years ago, he passed away. Um, and like a lot of people, and I started to gather this uh, in the stories of all or see this, watching someone you love leave this earth is, is a mystery. 
there's no other way to describe it. And you, I am a scientist and a, love biology. And I was just like, I, I felt as he was passing away space around and pulsate. I felt him moving some force in him moving out. It was unbelievable. And I felt awe. Afterward, I uh, fell into a really hard state of grief, like a lot of people do. Um, Joan Didion writes about it beautifully. I, um, I, I was panicky. I was barely sleeping. Uh, I, could, I could teach and do some science, but that was about it. Um, I started to hallucinate almost. I'd see him places. Twice, I felt his hand on my back, you know, and I was just like, he's there. Um, and the lesson for us all, you know, Mark, um, it, it's akin to the work you do, which is I was, I lost my capacity for awe, which is often what happens with depression and anxiety and grief. And uh, if you're a prisoner and you're, you know, in solitary confinement or in combat or traumatized, and I went in search of awe, you know, I was doing this science, starting to write this book and feeling this grief. And I'm like, I got to go after this emotion. Right. And that led me to, you know, just to find it in all these eight wonders that and it taught me um, life persists. It goes onward and outward, as Walt Whitman said. And, it, and the people we love stay with us in unimaginable ways. So it was an incredible lesson. But it really told me this is, this is a practical emotion that is a guide to life. Becca, thank you so much for sharing that. There's so much love for you in the chat. And you know, like many others have said here, I'm so sorry for your loss, but thank you so much for sharing that because it's really moving. And I don't think I've ever heard the word awe used in connection with such a, a grief led yeah. loss, but of course it is a, yeah. a reminder yeah. of this, um, the preciousness of life and um, yeah. and the, the sort of cyclical nature and the fact that we spend most of our lives running away from the fact that we're all finite and we will all, um, you know, only have limited time on this planet. And that's why it's so important that we, practice our moral beauty and our collective effervescence and all these other wonderful things while we are still able to. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I, I, all I can say is thank you for showing that. It's very moving. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'd love to move on to practical examples. You've already hinted yeah. at loads and lots have come up in the chat, but um, in a moment, I'd love to maybe turn to the community and, and see what we might each want to take away from this and then we'll come to some questions. But you've obviously been researching this, you've written a fantastic book, but you're also a very wise human being. And I wondered if you might share some of your own day-to-day -day sources of awe? What is it that helps you connect with this, especially now you've tuned into it more? Where are you seeing awe in daily life? Mm. Well, you know, I think, I think the first thing to think about is just, you know, to, to develop a bit of an awe mindset, pause, quiet down. I suspect a lot of our members of the community out, out there are, are good at this. And try to approach things freshly, you know, just like, okay, I'm going to experience this without preconception, but that's a good start. But, you know, for me, and I really went after this with force while grieving and continue to this day, you know, we find in our research, people feel awe two to three times a week. So it's around us, right? And a lot of the great philosophical traditions have made that point. This is a state of mind we can access. So what do you do? Well, we've tested something called the awe walk, where you just walk. You do your usual walk, but you look for awe. It's being done by thousands of people around the world now, you know, and you find awe. I would really encourage people to think about who is a, a source of moral beauty for them. And then you can reflect on that person. You know, what have they given to you in life? What principles did they teach you? How does their, their place in your life still remain with you as you move through the day? Reflect on moral beauty. If you want to up the ante, Study a person's life who you admire. You know, for me during grief, it was Rachel Carson, the great environmentalist, and then Gandhi, and it changed my life, you know. Um, obviously, nature, like just take a moment. And we have a lot of, you know, you can practice this in different ways. Look at clouds, watch the sunset as you're an example as a child, you know, look at the night sky, uh, garden, etc. cetera. Um, and then I, you know, I... I think one of the, and the romanticists really believe this, music is so powerful, and yet we so often listen to it without intention. And I challenge, and, and in fact, it could be a good exercise right here, 
Um, well, you can ask the question however you want, Mark, but I love hearing from people like, how do they access awe with regular music, you know, that they listen to? What is it? And just to make that part of their music, musical diet. So I could go on, you know, the book has a lot of recommendations. We are good at finding awe. Modern life gets in the way. And your question tells us, go get it. Mm. Well, um... and by the way, someone's asking about the indigenous scholar, Dr. Yuria, Y-U-R-I-A, Selidwin, S-C-E-L-I-D-W-E-N. It's really important. A lot of these great ideas about awe that I write about in the book came out of her, you know, encountering um, indigenous scholars who have really, this is an old body of knowledge for them. I feel so touched to hear your personal examples that I thought I might just share a couple of my own as well. Let's so hear them. One is, I mean, I, I, I often take our dog for a walk um, and I've been in the habit of listening to podcasts and music. And of course, music, as you said, can be a source of all, as can an inspiring podcast about a wider good. But I've now got a practice, which is take a pause, consciously turn off the input and just be there. It's sort of like mindfulness in nature. But actually, it's amazing how often when I do that, I'm like, oh, I've never yeah. noticed how beautiful that tree is or something yeah. like that. So it's like consciously choosing to look for the ore. And nice. then I also, because I'm a cyclist, I often, you know, I obviously have an appreciation of nature when I'm in the park or somewhere beautiful, but I've noticed that you can also find ore in quite rugged urban environments. I can be like cycling in London in the rain in the middle of traffic and think, wow, look at the way the rain's coming down that building or like look at the leaves that are like nearly knocking me off my bike on the floor or something that's, you know, sort of what you might call urban awe, which I yeah. hadn't thought of before. Um, and then the, on the moral beauty front, I, I mean, I feel so blessed that within this community, we're constantly seeing examples of people doing kind things and it always yeah. gives me a boost. Yeah. What I try and do myself now is to always ask myself in any situation, this question of what would a kind person do? Knowing yeah. that I am a flawed human and I'm not always as kind as I'd like to be, but actually that question helps me then let go of my own need to justify what I'm doing or fight back or whatever and just kind of try and respond kindly. So you can sort of, I think you can kind of practice mm. moral beauty in the way we respond to the chaos around us. I, don't, I mean, I, it's always hard. But yeah, but those wonderful are the things I'm working on right now. Those are wonderful, really powerful. Why don't we turn back to this amazing community and ask, I mean, Daka, you've shared so many lovely examples. Um, you know, we've talked about moral beauty, the collective movement, nature. We haven't even really touched on visual art, but that's such an obvious yeah. source of all music, spirituality, the big ideas, and of course, the, the life and death. What is it you each might want to do? Let's say over the coming week, community, wherever you are right now in the world, what, would you, what are you going to try and do more of in, in the coming week to cultivate a little bit of everyday awe, a little bit more awe? Uh, I like that, <laughs> those two words together. So if you'd like to share in the chat something you're going to do, then we'll just watch a few of those. And I'm saying pay attention to the colours in nature, go rowing, uh, smile at strangers, stop and stare, do an awe walk, taking up your advice, look at the sky, stand still more, um, really look at trees, create some big ideas, a bluebell walk, rain, listen to people. I love the diversity of these, but really, yeah, depending on what, you're, what you've been saying, what are you seeing there? What's jumping out for you? Uh, I love some of the simple recommendations like listening to friends, family, or rain, right? So just sharpening our senses. Uh, and uh, also just, you know, the, the nature is powerful. And also just recommendations about just being. Like your, your first example, Mark, reminds us, then this is what Descartes and Einstein and Rachel Carson and others have said, like, this is a basic state of mind. Just, just be, right? Just go out somewhere and quiet things down and you'll find all. I love smiling of faces. How could that not be? Looking at a stranger in the eye. I love the moral beauty of these very simple social actions. This is great. Thank you all so much. Yeah, I love hugging really myself and mindful crocheting, noticing <laughs> kindness in others. This is giving me a really big boost. This is like moral <laughs> beauty in a chat here. It's great. It should be like, we should have this on, on tap instead of social media as a, as yeah. a kind of daily boost. Um, we're going to come to some questions now. So if you have a question for Daka, please use the Q&A and you can also vote on each other's questions. So a little thumbs up. And if you see a question you'd like to have answered, give it a thumbs up and it will jump up the list. But the um, top of the list currently is from Fiona, who says uh, she's studying for a master's in positive psychology and thinking about looking at awe uh, for her dissertation. 
And she's found that meditation, mindfulness and breath work can help to cultivate, you know, an environment where you might experience more awe. But can you tell us about any research or studies or, or, or you know, specific exercises that are known to induce awe? Yeah, I would recommend we've just published a paper, Maria Monroy, who's a first generation college student, now got her PhD, and I, 2022, Perspectives in Psychological Science, and it lists, it sort of surveys how you can make people feel awe and the, the benefits. And I would say, Fiona, getting after the relationship between awe and mindfulness is a great scientific question, and you will make a contribution. Um, and you can produce awe by having people watch BBC Earth and listen to awe-inspiring music and read stories of moral beauty, bring people outdoors and have them stand near big trees. Um, there are a lot of ways to make people feel awe. Um, if you're interested, we have film clips at alancowan.com. Um, and, and, and it's actually a pretty easy emotion to study scientifically, which is interesting. Very good. Thank you. Um, really good question from Jonah here. Can you speak to the sense of fear and terror included yeah. in the word awe, similarly to the way the word terrific derives from terror? You know, we think we awesome things can sometimes be quite, yeah, frightening. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when we use words, it leads to the misconception that these emotions are always separate. And in fact, emotions are always kind of uh, blending and sort of mixing. And we find um, to the question that about a quarter of awe experiences have pretty significant fear and terror in it. So somebody's been asking about psychedelics. About 15 to 20 percent of people who take psilocybin LSD feel terror, right? They think they're dying or psychotic or whatever. So awe does a lot of awe experiences have fear in it, uh, but you can pull them apart. Terror is about thinking about the end of life. Horror is about brutality and destruction. And awe is really the recognition of vast mysteries uh, that we don't understand. So uh, they're sometimes mixing, but most of the time separate. Great question. Well, there's another powerful question here from Laura, um, who says that she finds nature where she often experiences awe is starting to also cause pain. For yeah. example, was at a beach with all this beauty and then saw plastic on the beaches and dead birds. So how can we be in awe and embrace awe, but also give space to some of the sadness and tragic things that are happening, I guess, particularly in this case, yeah. in relation to environmental destruction? Yeah, I mean, this has been one of the most astonishing human dimensions to the climate crises is what's called climate dread, you know, and I, I bet everybody feels it out there. We used to just go to the, I used to go to the Sierras and marvel at them. And now I think about the trees that are dying and the forest fires and the loss of rain, all human caused. I would recommend, um, uh, Amanda called it climate grief, that everybody um, check into Rebecca Solnit's new book, Climate Hope, or something to that effect. And then we have a new series on the Science of Happiness podcast called Climate Hope Science. Uh, and it has Rebecca Solnit in it, who's a leading voice in turning to awe and hope and moral beauty as we respond to the moral, the climate crises. Patrick Gonzalez is a Nobel Prize winning climate scientist at Berkeley. He's on our show. And there are a lot of reasons to be awe-inspired about how we're responding. We are in the greatest energy revolution in human history right now shifting out of fossil fuels and the data are really pointing to that in the next 20 years so we need to cultivate these emotions of awe and hope uh, as well as realistic horror to counter the climate crises yeah and i really want to honor and thank you and your colleagues for bridging what i think is often not bridged which is these areas around well-being and psychology and mental health and flourishing and then there's all the wonderful work about you know, the, the, well, the well-being of our planet. And these two spheres don't overlap as much as we'd like them to. And I think yeah. I listened to that episode, the first in your new series, and I thought it was wonderful. Yeah. And so I'd highly recommend that. And in fact, we're going to include a link to the, the podcast in the follow-up email that everyone will get tomorrow, as well as the wonderful chat file and the video from today. But let's come to this question from Joshua, who's a colleague of mine. Hi, Joshua. Nice, nice to have you here. Joshua practices a lot of uh, collective effervescence and moral beauty in supporting the volunteers in our community. Nice. Um, he says he's fascinated by the idea of synchronicity and coincidences that seem meaningful, like they might reveal an underlying pattern in life. I can relate to that as well. So yeah. he says, I sometimes experience wonder due to these seemingly meaningful coincidences. Do you have any reflections on the idea of awe in connection with synchronicity? 
Yeah, what a spectacular question. And, and uh, in other realms, they call it epiphanies, right? Where like in literary analysis where, or Nora calls it serendipity, where it's like your, your mind is contemplating some big questions about life. You know, why did my brother die in my case? Or will I fall in love? Or what's meaningful work, et cetera. And then you're, you're looking at the world and, and sort of making sense of different things. And suddenly an idea unites a disparate set of observations, right? You go, oh, this is the meaning of life and death uh, through an observation or a synchronicity. Um, and I think it's that's very hard to study scientifically because <laughs> you got to produce sy synchronicity in the lab. That's tough, but it's very real. And I would really consult literary analyses of epiphany where, and that's what it is, which is literature often hinges on a character struggling with a question and suddenly all these things come together and they're like oh i understand how complicated my father is right um and 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 it brings about awe and insight through that such synchronicity yeah great I, question i i really like that and i sometimes occasionally things will happen where you think oh my goodness it's almost as if the universe has willed this to be so yeah and so that you know the the um, spiritual part of me wants to believe there's some divine greater power making it happen. And the sort of skeptical um, scientist in me makes me think, well, that could have happened by pure chance. But I, what I like is the fact that my, the fact that my brain wants to go that to the fact that there's some greater connectedness implies to me that that is something innate and something powerful about the connection between us, that we're almost looking out for the, the connections in things. And that gives life this greater meaning. Well, and that's the beauty of awe is that it and, and it it puts us into this state of wonder and the mind is just generating new complicated ideas about what's just happened to you, right? Why did I feel my brother's hand on my back, mm. you know, twice and really feel it there? And a lot of people might take that state of wonder to spiritual ideation, right? Oh, it's he's still around in some quantum physics way. And so that's the beauty of awe is it, it spurs us to these acts of the imagination that are so important to us. Uh, Mitch has asked, do you feel that all works in partnership with gratitude, uh, an emotion that we cultivate a lot of in this yeah. community? How do they relate? Very much so. I mean, out of awe, we, we often feel grateful. We feel reverential. We feel like things are given to us, right? So one of the people I interviewed for my book is Malcolm Clemens Young. Uh, a, um, a dean of uh, Grace Cathedral here in, San in the Bay Area and a spiritual leader. And he felt awe as a 10 year old looking at the light on a mountain lake. He went outside and he was camping and he saw this light, you know, it was at dawn and he was just blown away. And it put him into a state of gratitude like, what spiritual being would give me so much beauty? And so awe is very often a catalyst for, for really deep gratitude. Of, what all the things that are given to us right um so good question mm. Jana has asked something or, or raised awareness to something that happened in the chat a bit earlier which i missed but somebody had apparently been talking about the difference between your lovely term collective effervescence and another term we hear in the news like herd mentality which perhaps implies a bit more of a mindless way of being together in a group maybe you could discuss the difference between these different ways of being together and how can we you know, um, how can collective effervescence be a positive thing to someone who might be skeptical or cynical about this idea that we're all just being a, a herd of believers? Every human tendency can be put to good and bad uses, right? And, you know, our capacity for dance and sport and, you know, food and share, it, 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 um, it can go in many directions. And collective effervescence has that quality, right? A lot of collective effervescence at a political march or dancing to music or singing with friends or praying together in ritual at church unites people's minds and, and you start to share a sense of meaning and beliefs. And that's really important for human communities to, to have united minds and to share an understanding of the world, it's part of the fabric of collaborative societies. But at the same time, that's what Adolf Hitler did, right? He had these big rallies of collective effervescence. That's what Donald Trump's rallies were like. They were filled with, you know, collective emotion and they planted into people's minds uh, problematic ideas in my view, right? So these emotions 
And any emotion has this quality can be put to, to good and bad use, right? Anger can lead us to protest injustice, which it does, the studies show, and, and be effective. And it can also lead to aggression uh, so uh, against strangers. So that's the job of society, is to, to try to figure out ways to put emotions to good uses. Yeah, and to your point about big ideas, which you didn't really touch on, and also moral beauty, I guess, if we're doing collective effervescence in support of some sense of greater good rather than self-aggrandizement or yeah um you know um yeah harm to others then i think that's a good indicator i agree um, pretty close sg has asked uh, or has made the point that children seem to find awe in lots of places but do you yeah. think we're all born with a gift of awe, which maybe tends to fade as we take on responsibilities and grow up and, and maybe it's only in a life-changing situation that adults kind of reevaluate what's important. What's your sense of awe over the life course? We, you know, I always try to rely on scientific evidence to really answer these kind of questions, and we just don't know. Uh, we just published one of the first studies of children in awe, showing their awe in art museums makes them kinder and less stressed and more physically robust. Um, I, you know, I think that the the thinking is the theorizing, and we'll see where the data land is that that first 15, 20 years of life had so much awe in it because you're developing theories about the world. And awe is an engine of understanding social beings and nature and the laws of physics and art, music. Awe just animates intellectual discovery, and, and that's what young people have to do. They have to become effective members of, of the world. And then, you know, regrettably, and the happiness curves show this too, like as you head into the middle of life, <laughs> you're just like losing, you know, joy and awe. And, and that's been replicated in 46 countries. So I think I'm statistically hunt... right at the bottom of that trough in happiness yeah. in my age, current age 49. So that's yeah, uh, your, so your life is from here, hopefully. post, you know, so, <laughs> but, but it's going to be good news from here on out, Mark. So, yeah. and and I think that, you know, that raises a lot of interesting questions about, you know, how awe trails off. And then maybe, you know, the last 40 years of life, it just gets so rich and multi-layered as you head into the last part of life. And I love Rachel Carson, who really has this beautiful essay that I summarize um, in the book, Teach Your Child to Wonder. And it's just about here's how we can get kids to feel awe. And here's how we can keep it with us as we age. And I will note for everybody out there, another part of this equation that we don't talk enough about is the awe we feel as caregivers to children. Uh, some of my most intense experiences of awe in my life, many of them were just in free form play and wandering and wandering with my daughters, right? And somehow evolution built into us this joined sense of awe in caregiving and, and children to to develop into healthy beings. Mm, well said. Um, Kay Shaw has just asked if we could have a, um, please have the eight wonders of life reminded in the chat. Why don't I see if I can remember what you told us? So you said nature and uh, music and visual arts, and then there was mm, the moral beauty, the kindness stuff, the collective movement and effervescence, spirituality, the big ideas, epiphanies, and then the life and death stuff. Stuff. is that is that have I, is that have I covered the eight there you you uh, a plus <laughs> yeah Excellent. so just to repeat well, we haven't what... really talked about much actually is visual arts and the, yeah. the, do you want to say a little bit about that because we haven't really covered it god you know and thank you I was raised by a visual artist so it, it means a lot to me you know visual art uh great paintings Mesoamerican visual design in in temples and pottery and ceramics and and the like uh, Berlin street art, which is ma amazing, you know, et cetera, Ro Rodin's hands, his cathedral of hands. We are constantly producing visual art that makes us feel awe. Uh, and it does so in a couple of ways. You know, one is it, it hints to us about big ideas we should be thinking about. So you see Picasso's Guernica, I think 1937 or whatever, whatever year it was, when people see that, and it's this vast painting, they're like, oh my God, look what hor war, war does, right? War is horrifying. Fascism is horrifying. The other thing that visual art does 
is it it produces the direct state of awe, right? It it's like you're hallucinating. So there are a lot of artists who paint what looks like spiritual visions or psychedelic experiences. Mesoamerican art has a lot of this, where the patterns that you'll see in Mexican art is about putting a person into directly into the state of awe. And you know, just to give you, I love awe because it allows us to champion for art, public art. There's really cool work out of the United Kingdom, Mark, showing the more awe-inspiring a part of a city is, the healthier people are. Wow. Right? If you're in a part of a city where there are cool sculptures and nice street art or whatever is going on, beautiful architectural design, your body is stronger through awe, right? So it's an argument for more art. Art, mm. not war, <laughs> as they used to yeah. say. Wonderful. Um... We're getting towards the end of our time together, but still some fantastic questions. Thank you all so much for these great questions. Devika, um, who I know is one of, a regular user on our app, and if you'd like to join the Action of Happiness app community, uh, anyone who isn't already there, it's a wonderful ongoing part of this kind of experience, sharing collective ideas together all day, every day. Um, but the, uh, she says, thanks. Um, these ideas seem to be similar to a practice which she does anyway, which she calls hunt the good stuff, you know, like in nature, or like a gratitude practice. Are there any more specific practices that you could suggest for awe, like a hunt the good stuff? What else is there that we could do practically? Yeah, at Greater Good in Action, ggia.berkeley.edu, we have a few. Uh, write down a story of awe, right? Listen to music in a way that brings you awe. Watch awe-inspiring videos. Um, um, you know, read a story of moral beauty. Go on the awe walk. Um, and then I have... Uh, dozens that I've been working with, uh, with um, one of the founders of Pinterest, like look at clouds, um, touch a tree, and, and just think about its age. Um, you know, the, in Bhutan, they have a lot of contemplative practices ima around imagining the cycle of life. Imagine somebody you love as a child, all the way to the end of life, right? And, and that gives you the sense of va the vastness of a life cycle. So even there's even new research on contemplate the end of life as a way to find awe and a sense of meaning, right? As you suggested earlier, Mark. So a lot of really concrete practices that are coming. And if you're an educator, stay tuned for our awe course uh, coming out in October too, as a, a way to cultivate awe. Fantastic, thank you. Um... We, we, I feel like we've got a very like-minded community here. We all kind of buy into this. We all come here because we care about this concept. But Renee has a question, which I think is relevant for those of us that want to spread more of this in the world. Yeah. And it's how do we cut through cynicism in yeah. some people who might just think, oh, or, you know, you know, come on, life's too short. There's a cost of living <clears> crisis. My, I'm ill. My job is stressful. I, I haven't got time for this. How, how you know, and that's a very, you know, people are dealing with very real yeah. financial health other concerns is, is all like a fluffy nice to have luxury or is it something that we can genuinely help everyone discover a bit more of yeah you know the and that's really in some sense the most urgent question is how do we spread this um and you know mark i mean for 20 years i've been teaching things like compassion gratitude and now all to very skeptical audiences whose work has lives on the line medical doctors, nurses, federal judges, police officers, et cetera, school teachers who are really overstressed in the United States, they hunger for all. Um, we've already talked about actionable ways you can bring it into your life for a minute or two. And my way to counter the cynicism to the question is to rely on the science that I review in the book, which tells us there's nothing better for the mind and the body than finding awe, right? It makes you more creative, less stressed, feel like you have more time, more scientifically rigorous, less polarizing. It helps your heart, your immune system, and your brain all five to 10 minutes of awe, right? I think it, it's the most powerful source of healthy mind and bodies out there. And when I talk to doctors, what they want to know is what helps people live good lives. And when they hear these data, which I summarize in the books, they, they are prescribing nature, right? They are telling awe stories. They're having patients tell awe stories. So I use the, the science on health and happiness as the, the counter to cynicism. Very good. 
And it makes me want to paraphrase a quote I once heard said, I think in the context of meditation, but it might, it could be said, we should all have five to 10 minutes of awe in our lives every day, except for in stressful times when we should make it 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I should have said that in the book. That's a good one. So I agree. Um, um, this has been a wonderful time together. I'm so grateful for all the work you're doing and for you being with us. And, and also to everyone who's been part of this conversation, it's really felt like a global community sharing inspiration together. Um, so much to, to sort of try and hold in mind and you've shared so many wonderful ideas, but I wondered if there's a, a, a closing thought or idea that you'd like us to really take away from this today. Yeah, I would challenge people, you know, the, the, I think the central idea in the book is everyday awe. It's around us. Just, just like you said, just pause, put stuff to the side, open your mind to things, think about what's mysterious, and then use those eight wonders. You know, is it nature, music, somebody's moral beauty? Um, but, but allow yourself to feel it. It's, it's all around us um, and there to be cultivated. Wonderful. So tomorrow we're going to send around a link to the video of this conversation, the chat file, a link to the book, to your Greta Good Science Center, to the podcast. Um, so thank you for sharing these resources with us. Thank you for being with us today, Daka, and keep up this awe-inspiring work. Thank you, Mark. It's been a, a wonderful conversation, seriously. All the best. See you soon. Thanks, okay. everyone. Bye-bye.